everyone. Welcome back. I hope you've been enjoying your cream teas. It's so thrilling for us to come to Folkestone, which is where most of Homefront has been set. And it's so exciting to walk down the streets on which we've set some of our scenes to find ourselves on Slope Road or maybe not on Bouverie Square, which is now your Asda. But all the same, it's so exciting for us to be here in Folkestone, to be here in the ground. So thank you very much for having us all here. I'm Martha, the sound designer on Homefront, and with us we've got the directing and writing cast who are going to answer some questions which I'll be putting to them. And I'm going to start by asking Jessica the very straightforward question. Why did we choose Folkestone? It was very important that we chose somewhere, uh, a location where everybody knew that the war started, the day that the war started. And Folkestone being a military town was uh, sort of electrified by the news immediately. We chose Folkestone because it still looks very much like it did then. It has an extremely posh end. <laughs> and uh, the, the sort of working class, poorer fishing community end to it, which were very easy to represent in sound. It was very exciting in sound. Um, and we also chose Folkestone because you could hear the war in Folkestone, you could hear the bombing occasionally, sometimes deafeningly, but always a, a low rumble. Um, and it just paid us back so well with so much, um, not only um, things we discovered on our own, but things that people from Folkestone told us. So uh, we never regretted that in folk, home front in Folkestone. Now, there was an enormous response um, to the war effort, and I wanted to ask Kieran, what especially was the contribution made by women? The start of the war, um, the country was in complete chaos. The, they, they had a weak and ineffectual government, so they obviously needed quite a lot of creative imagination on our part there. But uh, home, <laughs> home Front, um, as a term, didn't come until 1916, 1917, so before the kind of mechanics of government and state organized organizations like the Women's Land Army and um, the, the Ministry of Food, which was referenced earlier. Uh, there was a lot of Britain prided itself on volunteerism, so... Um, Particularly in Folkestone, for example, there was uh, the Folkestone War Refugees Committee was set up straight away um, in order to support the uh, quarter of a million Belgian refugees who came through the town seeking a safe place to live and were largely welcomed by the country. Um, the, there was a huge amount of voluntary organisations set up by women in the town, um, particularly the for instance, the Belgian Relief Fund. And there were lots of women who, off their own back, because it wasn't until later in the war that women were sent to help with um, nursing and caregiving at the front, a lot of women, off their own back, uh, bought ambulances and uh, went to see how they could help on the continent. One of those women was a woman called uh, Elsie Inglis, who who uh, went to the war office when war, war started and said, how can I help? And the uh, officer said, good lady, go home and be still. And she, fortunately, she didn't. She went and helped in Serbia. Um, then there was another woman, also an Elsie, who we reference in the show, called Elsie Knocker, who uh, went uh, with her friend, or possibly more than friend, uh, Mari Chisholm, to uh, help in France as an ambulance driver. And those two Elsies, uh, their kind of pioneering spirit, we poured into the character of, uh, of Isabel uh, Gren, who, who bought her own uh, ambulance and went to help in Belgium at the, in very early on, and we wanted to convey that. And so we poured all that, that spirit, that volunteerism, that drive into the character, as did Keeley, who plays the character and who helped organise tonight. So that's what happened. By the second year of the war, it wasn't just women who were working. Children were also being drawn into the propaganda machine, weren't they, Sebastian? They were indeed. It was a changing world and it was a desperate situation as far as the war was concerned and everyone was fair game 
And across the country, recruitment drives were done for young men to sign up. And often these were done in bars and theatres and places where people congregated and a little entertainment was put on in our show. It was put on by a young girl, Jessie, who was at the time about 13. And um, men would then sign up as a consequence of these very patriotic, uh, very joyous occasions. And then the next thing they knew, they were in the middle of a war. That's not all that children were used for, was it? There were grimmer things that girls had to do. Yes, that's right. Um, I think the, uh, the toll of breaking bad news and carrying telegrams became a bit much for postmen, and so uh, the job was given to Boy Scouts instead. And Boy Scouts were so bad at it and so uh, glib and rude as they delivered the telegrams that it fell on uh, little girls to deliver... Um, the, the awful news that uh, members of the household had died and they were called the little angels of death and people used to sort of dread it when a you know, 10 year old girl opened the garden gate um, and uh, that was great for us um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Katie's just going to add something to this well something that Jessica and I like to get into as many episodes as possible was a telegram because they are they're really good value for dramatic tension and especially if you don't know what's in the telegram, you know, you've just already got the stakes quite high. And then, of course, there's barely any information on the telegram. So then it's, you have absolutely no idea how this character died and what the real story is. So I think that's very useful as well because you can kick off a story like that with everybody wondering what the heck happened. Uh, so they're just, uh, they're good they're not as good as letters. I do like a letter, because then you can get even more in. But uh, telegrams are good. As the wounded came back from the front, the hospitals were absolutely overwhelmed, and private homes were requisitioned. Sean, this led to some quite extraordinary storylines for us, didn't it? It did. Now, it may or may not surprise you to know that we didn't know what was going to happen either. Uh, we certainly didn't have season 15 planned when we were writing season the early seasons. And when Kieran came across... I a nugget of news about uh, asylums being emptied and private hospitals and long-term nursing homes um, being requisitioned for soldiers and, and the war. And the question came up, well, what do they do with all the people who've been in the asylums uh, for all these years? And they were basically handed back to their families with very short notice. Uh, and, of course, the upper classes had, and I think still have, uh, a way of disposing of the inconvenient embarrassments. Um, so people were put into asylums uh, and declared in incapable for things like becoming pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, so we all thought Victor's mother was dead, and so did Victor. Uh, and then once we had the news about the clearing of the private asylums, we went, oh, what if? And that's how what actually one of the major characters uh, in the story uh, came to play such a prominent part uh, when Adeline had been locked up for having Victor all those years before. All over the country, people were grieving for their lost boys. And in their grief, they began to look for other answers. And Sarah, this feels quite different to how today. Why was spiritualism gaining so much ground? I think in the, in the same way that it is popular today, that if you lose someone you love, you long to hear them once again. And so many people had lost so many loved ones, and they hadn't got a body and they hadn't got a burial, that they just wanted to believe above all else uh, that those, their sons, their husbands, their lovers were happy wherever they were. So they flocked in that way uh, to spiritualism and it trebled during the First World War. But uh, to, me, to, to us in the program, it fell into two different groups. There are people who have a genuine gift or at least believe they have a genuine gift and then there are people who would like to make a quick buck and see it as an entertainment. Everyone was feeling the strain, of course, but nurses were very, very put upon. Sean, can you tell us more about our own Bevan Hospital in Sandgate? 
the Bevan in Sandgate was a, a VAD hospital, so it was largely staffed by uh, volunteers, VADs, uh, which meant the, the few qualified staff who were there were under enormous pressure. While we were researching this, it, it had also become an overflow of the military hospital at um, the military, Chorncliffe, thank you, the military camp. While we were researching this, we also uh, discovered this wonderful clipping about a woman called Margaret Bishop, who had been pretty much single-handedly running all the catering and the food at the Bevan Hospital as a volunteer, uh, who would often get in at eight, uh, 4 a.m. Uh, in the morning to make sure everybody uh, was fed and organised everything. We brought her in as a minor character, but what happened immediately after the war was that she died of exhaustion. Um, poor Miss Bishop. And um, it was acknowledged, really, in the papers locally that she was as much uh, a victim of the war as uh, any of the soldiers who died because she'd given her so much of herself. So these two things kind of merged into the figure of Olive Hargreaves, uh, the nurse who was under enormous time and exhaustion pressure and who coped with it by being ever stricter and tougher and harder on everybody else but on herself as well. Women weren't only working as nurses but also in factories that had been converted in order to make munitions to send out to the front and Allegra the working conditions were appalling weren't they? Yes, so you might have heard the term um, canary girls, which is what the munitionettes were called when their skin went yellow from working with TNT. Um, although one of the first-hand accounts we heard about, um, she described it as not a bright, nice yellow, but more of a mucky green colour that their skin went. Um, but along with that, some of the other symptoms of working closely with TNT um, and TNT poisoning... Um, things like swollen fingers and exhaustion and hair starting to fall out and the, munich the munitionette girls' uh, period stopping. For young girls with not a lot of education, which could often be the case, you could interpret all of those as symptoms of something else, if you didn't know better. Women in the workplace rather unfairly led to concerns about female promiscuity. And many unmarried mothers had been abandoned or treated very cruelly by young men. Sarah, how were these young women expected to survive? There were homes for unmarried mothers that were often set up by uh, good upper-class Christian women to teach these wayward women how to behave. I mean, I think these women were really horribly treated because sometimes these were young girls who'd been raped by soldiers, weren't they? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, you know, women... Still today, in my opinion, don't get a fair deal. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but absolutely, a hundred years yeah. ago, it was uh, much worse. Yeah. It was Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> How hard was it to keep the nation fed, given the shortage of farmers? It was very difficult indeed, ah. Martha. <clears throat> and uh, also, it was fell upon the agricultural community to provide a lot of uh, wheat for bread, which went straight to the front. Uh, and often their farm animals were requisitioned uh, and sent to the front too. Most of us will know the story of War Horse, so you've got that. And also you've got a community which has for hundreds and hundreds of years been very much untouched by change. So you could say that <clears throat> rural workers living in the heart of Devon, for example, lived a life that was entirely different to definitely to somebody living in a big city or even in a place like Folkestone. They were living in a, by a set of rules and by a set of uh, customs which really hadn't changed for, for many hundreds of years. And so suddenly as the war came and the pressure was put upon them to provide food for the nation and also that the agricultural workers were being called up uh, to serve in the war. So there was a great deal of pressure on the uh, agricultural communities of this country at that time. Um, shell shock or war neurosis affected hundreds of thousands. Katie, you season, led, season 11, can you tell us more about um, shell shock? What I find interesting about the term shell shock is that even fairly quickly into the war, the First World War, uh, the shell shock was not the term that the physicians were using. But it's so catchy 
a term. It's such a beautiful alliteration that, of course, it's survived. Um, so the, the doctors at the time were talking either about hysteria or neurasthenia. So apparently the, uh, the working class soldier was more likely to be a hysterical malingerer and then the upper class kind of officer was apparently much more, uh, a much more legitimate candidate for uh, genuine uh, trauma, and they called this uh, neurasthenia. So um, obviously this was basically rubbish, but, uh, but all that language was around, and yet shell shock is the term we're using, you know, 100 years later, that's, the, that's what survived. Um, so so we, try, we tried to represent that uh, within our uh, season to show the way in which the kind of class prejudice kind of panned out in terms of how the soldiers were treated. But there were also two very different approaches to, uh, to treating all of these traumatized soldiers, and one of which was the kind of talking therapy and psychoanalysis or, you know, some kind of form of talking therapy. Uh, and then there was a kind of much sort of stricter kind of pull your socks up or we'll uh, electrocute you type uh, approach to the whole thing. And, um, and they both had mixed results. There is, of course, um, an, another very important reason that the front was set in Folkestone. And perhaps, Sarah, we should talk now about the events of the 25th of May, 1917. Sure, all of you from Folkestone know about the events of the 25th of May, 1917 when the German Gotha bombers were supposed to bomb London, but because of low-flying cloud, turned around and dropped their bombs, they thought, and they wanted to hit the railway line. Uh, but this came without warning to the people of Folkestone. 96 people died, and, it was, and 61 people died from one single bomb that fell on Stokes Brothers greengrocers, and that was the worst. Uh, atrocity of the war from one bomb and it affected the whole of Folkestone I cannot I don't have the arrogance in me to give all of you people a history lesson about your own hometown but if you haven't read this book I would absolutely suggest you do buy it and read it, it's very detailed and I would just like to say that Martin who was uh, one of the people who wrote this book, gave us an awful lot of help, as did Margaret Kerr, who's here today. I, without it, we couldn't have done the programme, but also it is thanks in the main to Margaret that every single one of the names and where their resting places are, um, we know this now, but all their names are on a plaque in the Remembrance Gardens in Sandgate Street. So uh, I think actually that Margaret deserves a big round of applause. I think Michael Burkenshaw is springing to his feet. <laughs> a little song to bridge um, home front with the purpose of this event, which is to raise funds for police pavilion. That poor pavilion boarded up ten years or more You should have seen it in its glory days before the First World War It was quite the place to be for dainty sandwiches, cakes and tea Though the price was high, probably to deter the likes of me And now it's an empty shell in need of some TLC To bring it back to what it used to be Lee's Pavilion, you're a tea shop in a million You're a theatre, you're a concert hall supreme As a building you are listed as of architectural interest But it's not just what you are, it's what you mean It's not just what you are, it's what you mean It's not just what you look like, it's the various things you've seen During the World War I when they was off to fight the Hun the raw recruits would come here for their final bit of fun. There was concerts, there was songbirds, comedians telling jokes. The lads would laugh and drink their tea like proper grown-up blokes. Then off they'd set for France to do what they had to do. They was doing that for me and for you. 
Please pavilion, you're a tree shop in a million, you're a theatre, you're a concert hall supreme. As a building, you are listed as of architectural interest, but it's not just what you are, it's what you mean. It's not just what you are, it's what you mean. You started as a tea room, but there's other things you've been, cause after a while the Folkestone folk just wouldn't come here to eat. Someone said it's a theatre, let's fill it with theatre seats, where once we hosted heroes, we'll have no old cowards instead. That went well for quite a while until Dumont went dead, and now it's just deserted, silent as the grave. It's our heritage, it's a place we ought to save. Lee's Pavilion, you're a tea shop in a million, you're a theatre, you're a concert all supreme. This is building just listed as a party But it's not just what you are, it's what you mean. It's not just what you are, it's what you mean. You ought to mean a lot, the town should value what it's got. For a while you was a club, but now you've just been left to rot. Some buildings are expendable, but this one's surely not. It's Lee's Pavilion, da da da, da 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 da, da. Lee's Pavilion, da 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 da, join in, da 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 da, Lee's Pavilion, harmonist, da da da, Lee's Pavilion, la 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 la, Lee's Pavilion, la 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 la, very slow fade out. <laughs>